Amen, amen. Well, I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I'm excited as we continue the sermon series called Power. We're talking about power and mentoring. I think it's a really thing, a concept that we need to understand and, and to be talking about in 2020, especially right now, and just life events that's been taking place in our country and in our world. There, a lot of people ask me, Macon, and a lot of people say this, they say, Macon, you're well beyond your years. And the way I received that is not in a prideful way. I received that from two, uh, two understandings popping in my mind. The first one, as I'm able to do what I'm able to do at 22 years old, by the grace of God. That's why I'm able to do what I'm able to do. And the second understanding, the second principle, the reason why I'm able to do what I'm able to do at 22 years old is because I've been discipled well. And those two concepts, I think a lot of people we misunderstand and we don't see the importance in, <clears throat> the important, how important they are, but it's really for all of us to understand that when we are able to do things by the grace of God and that we have been discipled well, that's what's going to allow the church to flourish the next 60 years. That's what's going to allow the church to flourish the next 100, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 million years as long as we're here on earth. That's what's going to allow the church to flourish if we understand the power of mentoring. I think a lot of us in this moment, we might have someone mentoring, we might not. I don't know your story. But hopefully you do. Hopefully you're pouring into somebody. If you say that you're a believer of Jesus Christ, hopefully you have somebody that you're pouring into. So this morning the message, the title of the message is You, Me, and Kingdom Growth. I think this is a very important concept to understand this morning. Paul is teaching Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 uh, through 7. That's where we'll be at, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 7, if you want to go ahead and turn there. But you, me, and Kingdom Growth. Hopefully... As a believer, if you're a believer in the room, your default is to say, hey, I do believe kingdom growth is extremely important. Hopefully, that is your default. If not, then we'll be talking about that this morning. And so my question this morning, before we really get to the meat of the message, is how much does God's kingdom mean to you? How much does God's kingdom mean to you? A few weeks ago, I was able to go on a time of rest. I got to go out west. It was a blessing. It was awesome. I enjoyed it. And one of the places that we got to go to was Cody, Wyoming. Some of you in the room might have been to Cody, Wyoming. Some of you might not have been. But one thing that if you go there, they're going to tell you very quickly that they're the capital of the world for rodeo. And I enjoy rodeo. I like watching. I think it's cool. It's wild. It's risky. It's kind of my, what I like to do. So I like to go and watch. I was trying to ride a bull. They didn't let me. And so just like going and, and having fun and, and experiencing this, of watching this rodeo. And all of us know in this room that coronavirus has really affected most of our lives in this room. So back in March when really the shift started to happen, there, everyone at the rodeo, people on the board of the rodeo said, hey, we don't want to shut down. The governor of Wyoming said, hey, we're going to shut everything down. And the board said, yeah, we just don't think so. And so they started to enter a conversation. They started to enter into a fight saying, hey, we're not shutting down because of coronavirus. And I think it was an awesome experience as I was understanding this right in the stands, watching this thousands of people have gathered together for one purpose. But they've gathered together for one purpose to celebrate the rodeo, to celebrate these men and women getting on horses, getting on bulls, doing these things that they're at, celebrating that happening, that they're enjoying it. It brings them life. It brings them satisfaction. I mean, they're excited about what's happening here. And they don't want to let that go. They're willing to fight for it. And I became convicted sitting there and understanding the last few months of the church. I don't feel like we've been fighting as much as we should have been. I think we need to understand, like, I believe with all my heart, and it brings me great joy and a blessing when I'm struggling throughout the week to be able to know that I can come together collectively as the believers of the, of the body of Jesus Christ. Some in this room might not be believers just yet, but come together and celebrate what Jesus has done for me. That we can gather together is a blessing. And I think we have to understand do we, how much does kingdom growth mean to you? Our default is, hey, we'll give everything for it, but we have to actually live that out. Because when people outside the world, everything's chasing after every generation. Saying, hey, this is what you need to put your existence in. This is what you need to put your faith in. This, that, and the other. And here at the church, we've got to say, no, 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 no. We're the loudest voice because we matter the most because we care about your eternal salvation. That we want you to understand Jesus. We want you to see Jesus more, so we're willing to fight. This next thing, this next story that I'm going to tell you about, next thing, this event that's happening right now in 2020, is about a pastor. And when I continue the story, you're going to think it's happening in a third world country or somewhere where religious freedom isn't happening or isn't able to be obtained. But this is happening in California, the United States of America. The United States of America. 
This is where this is happening at. John MacArthur is a pastor of a, a fairly large-sized church in California called Grace Community Church. Right now, MacArthur is facing a lawsuit of $10,000 because he's allowing his church to physically gather. He's doing, they're doing exactly what we're doing right now. He's facing a $10,000 lawsuit, him personally. The church is facing another $10,000 lawsuit. So that's like somebody saying, you know, Macon's going to, right now since Macon's preaching, I owe the state of Georgia ten grand, and then the church itself. I don't have 10000 extra dollars. I don't. And so when we think about this right now, how much does God's kingdom mean to you? Right now, fellow brothers and sisters, not around the world, but in our states, are facing persecution. That are saying, hey, you can't come and physically gather. Like, we're doing exactly what they're doing right now. And it, and it continues, the fines continue. It says $1,000 a day. It's a it's $1,000 a day that they keep doing this. And or up to five days in prison. That's in America. That's not around the world. That's happening right here. And so when we ask this question, our default is, oh, we're willing to give anything for kingdom growth. But are you willing to give $10,000? Are you willing to fight the good fight of the faith? And no matter what that looks like, that, hey, if it's going to cost me $10,000, I'm going to do everything I can to push that away. I'm willing to enter the fight. So many of us wouldn't even be willing to enter the fight. At moments, I'm like, ah, $10,000 is a lot of money. I don't want to enter the fight. But John McCarthy understands the purpose just as much as the rodeo understands their purpose. Say, hey, we, the body of believers need to come together. That God has designed us as the church to bring about his gospel. That we are the ones going and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we're the ones mentoring people. That we're helping these generations grow in their faith. How much does kingdom growth mean to us? I think it's it's something that we all need to wrestle with. And we understand you, me, and kingdom growth. 2 Timothy 2, 1-7 says this. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. And an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is a hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful to be able to physically gather, Lord. We're not facing any friction right now gathering physically. God, we're not facing any friction uh, with the laws or anything like that. And Lord, that's a blessing. Thank you for that. Lord, we are here because we believe in Jesus Christ. We are here because somebody invited us that believes in Jesus Christ. We are gathered here under the name of Jesus because we believe that it brings salvation, redemption, reconciliation, forgiveness. That it brings love and compassion. That it brings everything that we need. It brings a community of believers that are willing, hopefully willing, to risk their lives in any sort of way that comes to them. Lord, I just pray in this moment that we have together, Lord, that we block out the noise that we block out what we think should happen, and we listen, Father, to what you're teaching us this morning. Lord, because we understand, Father, what's happening in California is in the United States of America. It's nowhere else. It's everywhere else, but it's in the United States of America for the first time we're really understanding it. So I just pray this moment that your spirit leads and guides us. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning I want to take these verses verse by verse, and so just really to help us understand what Jesus is teaching us through Paul. In our student ministry right now, we're walking through a sermon series called Who is my Paul and Who is my Timothy? And I think it's a beautiful representation of that Paul and Timothy's relationship that we all need to have with people as well. That it's an intimate relationship, not in a weird way, but in a way that is God's love. That it's an unconditional love. That it's an intimate way because Paul and Timothy know one another on a personal level. They know one another in a, in a way that they want to help each other see Jesus more. That Paul is teaching Timothy how to see Jesus more. Paul is mentoring Timothy how to see Jesus more. Paul is helping Timothy go teach others how to see Jesus more. Verse 1 says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We ask the question believers, as believers today, what gives us the strength? What gives us the ability to go be a mentor? To go be a Paul? What gives us the strength, as we see very clear in Scripture, is the empowerment of Jesus Christ through His grace. 
the empowerment of Jesus Christ through his grace. And I want us to all understand in the room, it doesn't matter if you just got saved five minutes ago. If the Lord Jesus has saved you five minutes ago, or if you've been saved 60 years ago. That what Paul is teaching Timothy, you then my child, be strengthened by the grace. That means every believer is able to be empowered. That every believer is able to be empowered no matter your past, no matter what's taking place, no matter how, how good you've been or how bad you get. All that's wiped clear because of Jesus' salvation. And says, hey, keep moving forward. I'm empowering you not because of who you are but because who you belong to. I'm empowering you because I have chosen you to be a child of God to carry out the will that I have. Like, that's exciting, right, church? Like, we are people that are being able to be strengthened, that we're able to be empowered by Jesus. Doesn't mean it's not difficult. Doesn't mean that it's not hard at times. But we know that we're able to fight the good fight of the faith because of the empowerment of Jesus. Verse 2, it says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What does entrust mean? What does this look like? Is an illustration... Um, some people about to come up right now, and, and I'm going to show you this through an illustration. Of what does it mean to entrust faithful men and women with the gospel? And to help them teach other people also. As they coming, I want us all to understand what does entrust actually mean. And what it means is to set before. To teach how to teach. To set before. To teach how to teach. Doing life together. If Pastor Stephen 10 years ago didn't pour life into me, I wouldn't be at the place I am right now. If he didn't say, hey, Macon, I see value in you, even though you might not see value in yourself, it's not because of who, who you are, but it's because who you belong to. Hey, I want to help you grow in your faith. I want to help you understand who Jesus is more. Not because I think I know a whole lot more than you, just because my life is to help you see Jesus more. That should be every life of a believer, is that we need to be helping other people see Jesus more. I remember when I was... In high school, for the first time, I preached when I was 15 years old. And I preached all about seven minutes, and my main point was um. And everybody was just like, who is this dude? But as we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, it's about the progress, not perfection. It's about saying, hey, I'm willing to help you be better in Jesus' name. I'm willing to take time to help you understand Jesus better. Like, we've got to get after it. And so I want them to help me illustrate this by doing life together, by taking chances and, and giving opportunities that might just seem too big. But what we understand this is to be, I remember also when I was in high school, I was 11th, 12th grader, both years. Uh, Kendall also, we were teaching the college and career Sunday school class. And I'm like, pastor came to us and said, hey, do you guys want to teach college Sunday school class? Our youth pastor, Tracy Sharp, and I'm like, ah, uh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> but we did it anyway. We started to teach and not, we understood what we were doing, not because our intelligence was more than them, just because our walk with the Lord was at a different place than them. And it was such a beautiful moment of my life with Kendall is because there's a young man named Tyler that was older than me, a couple years older than me, that I was able to help understand Jesus more and Jesus saved him than I was able to baptize him. And I'm younger than him. And so it doesn't matter about our physical age. It matters about where the, we walk with the Lord. It doesn't make us better, but it's just where we're walking with the Lord. And so I have uh, Reagan, if Reagan, and I, I want you guys to, to understand, Reagan is a student leader in our student ministry. She sings, she leads, she does an awesome job at everything she does. She loves people, and if you know her, she loves to talk just like me. And so, like, she loves getting after it. And so, when we look at this, and trusting faithful men and women with opportunities that might seem too big for them, we look at Reagan and say, hey, she's in middle school. She might not just be ready to step on stage yet and, and lead us. She might not just be ready. But who am I to say that? Who am I to think that? I'm not empowering her. Jesus is. Reagan is faithful to Jesus Christ. So we've entrusted her with the gospel. A few months ago, she was able to, to help someone understand Jesus more at the lunch table, and the young girl got saved. And now she's talking to her about baptism. Like, Reagan is a middle school girl. People might say, hey, you're just not ready yet. Listen, I say send her out. I say let's get it and send her out. She's faithful. Faithful is not about being perfect. Faithful is not about knowing everything. Faithful is about showing up when it matters. Faithful is about showing up when somebody's in need. Faithful is about showing up when we need to do some work. 
And so what this word entrusted means, it means that we are to set before, teach how to teach. And so I said, hey, Reagan, hey, hey listen, I want to teach you. I want to help you, not because I'm better, just because I'm a little bit further along in my walk with you. And say, hey, what you're going to need in your walk for you and to teach other people and to mentor people and to help your Timothys understand is the word of God. You've got to have this. You've got to have what Jesus says because you, everyone in the room cares nothing about making Joan's opinion. You're only listening to me because of the Bible. And so, hey, Reagan, take this Bible. You're going to need that. Hey, the journey's going to be long. The journey's going to be long. Jesus met every, he meets every spiritual and helps us and it meets every physical need. Maybe not in the way we think he should, but he does. And say, so, hey, Reagan, the journey's going to be long. But there's some water. Keep fighting the good fight. I'm here for you. Let's keep fighting it. Reagan doesn't have a lot of money. And so I say, hey, Reagan, here's some Chick-fil-A cards. I want you to go do life with somebody. Go, go buy somebody some, some food. Just talk to them. Let them understand that you care about who they are. Let them understand that you know their name, that you know their story, and that you care. So, hey, go do that, do that. And listen, one thing we all know if you've been in ministry, and we just all know this even if you're not in ministry, is ministry is messy. So these wipes are, is a symbolization of saying, hey, you're going to get your hands dirty sometimes. You're going to get in situations you probably don't want to be in, but it's for the gospel. It's for them to see Jesus more. It's to help them understand how to teach other people. Like, we got to get in it. It may not be convenient, which I promise you, it's probably going to be an inconvenience. It's not going to be convenient. It's not going to be comfortable. Our personalities might not be the type to fit it, but the gospel says, listen, I don't care about your personality. Jesus Christ is strengthening me. So you put that in and say, hey, Reagan, listen, you're doing an awesome job. I love your girl. Hey, and we send her on her way. But before we do, we say, whoa, hold on. I'm not abandoning her. Paul's not telling Timothy, hey, just go do your thing and, and, and be gone. He's saying, listen, I want you to teach others also. I've got your back. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here whenever you need me. I want you to help people see Jesus more. I don't care about her understanding my calling as much. I want her to understand her calling. Like my calling is my calling, which a lot of you know, if you know me on a personal level, you know you don't want a bunch of making Jones in this world. Like we've got enough right here, right? We've got enough. So my, my job, no, 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 I'm entrusting her maybe with an opportunity that might seem too big for her, but who am I to say an opportunity is too big for her? She's out there doing it. As a middle school girl. So I say, hey, Ray, I love you, girl. You go on and, and trust people. Find faithful men and women to entrust. Then uh, an awesome, awesome thing is JT Vest. He uh, leads our AV team. Abram Sumner as well. Abram, Abram Sumner helps him. Second man and, and really teaching and, and helping them after it. JT is an 11th grader at Sonorville. So, you know, say, hey, my job for JT is not to make him a making, not to grow kingdom making, but to grow the kingdom of God. So my job for JT is to say, hey, man, when we look at this and say, our, uh, give, uh, give people an opportunity to fulfill their calling or we will surely die, JT doesn't need to do my calling. JT needs to do his calling. And my job as his Paul is not to conform him to my ideology, but to conform him to what Jesus has said, right? It's to conform him and to help him fulfill his God-given gifts and his talents through whatever God calls him to do. This man loves flying planes. I'm not flying a plane. You don't want me teaching this man how to fly a plane. I'm teaching him how just to be faithful and trust and fulfill his calling. That's what JT is supposed to do. That's what, I mean, that's what I'm supposed to do for JT. That's what JT is supposed to do for the next person. That's what we're all supposed to do. So I say, hey, JT, I want to serve this to you. I want to help you. Man, this word you need, you got to keep that close to your heart. You need that to guide your life. That's what's going to help you. Man, the journey's long, but I'm here for you. We're fighting this fight together. Keep moving forward. We love you, man. Listen, at times... Like we said before, ministry is going to be messy. Ministry may not look the way you think it should look. More times than not, it doesn't. But I'm here for you. So many, so many people in the world, they say, hey, 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 listen, we're here. we show up for the mess. Oh, that's too messy. Now we jump back. No, 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 no. We, we run. We charge at it and say, we got some wipes. We want to help you. We want to be here for you. And then we say, hey, JT, there's moments in your life where you might come up on somebody and say, they just need, need a shirt. Might need something that you have. That you might not have a lot of, but you can spare one. And say, JT, there you go, man. And we send him on his way. We entrust him. Before you guys say, whoa, come back. JT, man, we love you, dude. We want to help you. We're your biggest encourager. Whatever you need, we want to help you accomplish. We want you to help you see Jesus more. We want you to help other people see Jesus more. And then we send him on his way. But we're there for him. Anytime he needs me, he can call me. And then Jason Dyer, I love this man. He got saved a, few, uh, a little while ago. He got baptized a few months ago. And I love him to death. As you can see, he's bigger than me. People like to say that, but no. Yeah, we were out in Nepal the other day, and um, a lady said that he was bigger than me. And she was like, where's that your buddy at? And I was like, which one? The small dude? 
but she thought he's bigger anyways. But, but Jason, I love this man to death. We've been talking a lot. We've been learning a lot together. So he's a fairly more of a newer believer, so he doesn't have as much understanding of theology as I do just yet. That doesn't make me better in any kind of way. It doesn't make me better at all, at all. It's just I'm in a different, different place in our path than he is. Yeah, and my job is to help him see Jesus more. My job is to help him more. And so Jason Dyer, he helps us with security on Wednesday nights for student ministry, as you can tell why. And he helps me lead the 11th, 12th grade boys. And you can see why as well, because uh, they're crazy. But listen, we love them. We get in there. It's a little messy sometimes. It's a little difficult sometimes. But we love them to death. We love hanging out with them. We love getting after it. Jason, at times, he says, man, make him. I don't know as much as I probably should. I might not need to be in this room. And I say, Jason, that's the exact reason you need to be in this room. Is because we don't come knowing everything. We don't come knowing everything. Listen, our mindset should be on the progress of people, not the perfection of people. Because if we're worried about the perfection of people, we all need to go home. No one will ever get a start if we're worried about the perfection. At 15 years old, I preached seven minutes. My main point was, um, like, that wasn't, that wasn't perfection. They were wondering who in the world this man was, right? And so Jason's sitting here. I said, Jason, I love you, dude. Listen, as you continue to grow and to learn just like I am, like, hey, here's some wipes, man. It's going to get a little messy. There's going to be moments where you want to, the people, are, you try to say, hey, let me open this up a little bit. And you try to open it and it just shuts. Like you just keep opening. Don't walk away from people. Don't give up on people. Just keep, just keep opening and opening and opening and say, Jason, I am here for you. I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know you. It doesn't matter. You're not perfection. It's about progress, about showing up, being faithful. These students, people, you, me, no matter how old we are, we need people to show up when it matters. And so Jason says, hey, man, here's, it's going to be long. It's going to be long, it's going to be long, it's going to be long, but man, it's going to be so worth it. It's going to be so worth it because we're helping people see Jesus more. And they're going to say, hey man, this word, dude, you got to get in it, you got to stay in it. There's some questions that I don't, there's some questions that he's asked me that we talk about it. And I'm like, dude, if it was making theology, this is my answer. But since I don't, it's not making theology, it's Jesus theology. There's some things I don't fully comprehend, even as a pastor, I don't fully comprehend. I say, Jesus, just help me understand this more. I say, I have to ask, say, Jesus, Please humble me. Please humble me because you know everything and I don't. I can't understand your thoughts in the way that I think I can sometimes. But Jesus says, listen, it's, that's what we have to do. And I teach Jason, I say, Jason, sometimes I have to be humble. I have to be honest with Jason, man. Sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm not humble enough and I need Jesus to knock me back down a little bit. And so you got to keep that close to you. And, and Jesus is, uh, as uh, Jason's growing in his faith with Jesus, there's a book, The Reason of God by Timothy Keller. This really helped me in my walk. And I said, hey, Jason, I want to equip you. I want to encourage you. I want to help you. I want to set you up for a win. I want to set you up for a win. Hey, here's a book that maybe be able to help you out a little bit. Some questions. Say, hey, Jason, I love you, dude. You're awesome. And I'm going to send you out. Before he goes, we say, whoop. And we say, hey, man, listen, I got your back. You don't understand something, you call me. If I don't understand what you don't understand, I call my Paul. Or I ask other questions, right? And, so, and then I say, hey, 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 go on your way, man. Go on your way. And then we understand from that, that's, that's the model of mentoring. Nothing, nothing perfect about it. It's just the model that we have that we say, hey, we're here for you. We're going to show up when it matters. We're going to teach you what Jesus says. And whatever you need, whatever you need, we'll do everything we can to make that happen. Because it's about seeing Jesus more. It's not about making his kingdom. It's not about me growing an ego. It's about people seeing Jesus. And I love, and I think a blessing of mentoring is, mentoring is just, as much for the person that's being mentored as for the, men, the one that doing the mentor. Like every step of the way that, like I have conversations with our students, I have conversations with adults, I have conversations with different people, and they ask me these questions, I'm like, wow, that's a good question. And then I have to go into the Word and study that, so I'm growing, I'm learning, I'm understanding. And that's the thing too, Jason, you know, he's like twice my age, physically, but doesn't mean young people can't help older people understand who Jesus is more as well. Because I understand more theological principles than him do at this moment. It doesn't make me better. It call, that, that, makes me, that makes me need to be living out the calling, saying, Jason, I want to help you see Jesus more. Like That puts a lot of weight and say, hey, hey I know I'm not going to get everything right, but I'm going to give Jason everything I can. Everything I can. And so we see that mentoring is, is just for you just as much as for the other person. And then verse 3, Paul, Paul switches a little bit to Timothy, and I think we all need to take take a moment to understand this is because we, we, we all of us are like, yeah, we can do that. We might not be fulfilling that calling in the way that we need to right now, but we can, we can do that. We can get better. We can do this, that, the other. And Paul says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What does share in suffering mean? 
What it means is to bear evil treatment along with. I think about this and I'm like, I'd rather not bear evil treatment along with my Timothy. If my Timothy gets in a situation, then I'm just going to let him or her deal with that. And I'm just going to take a step back. But Paul's saying, no, 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 no. You're going to experience suffering. You're going to experience evil treatment. And I'm here right with you. I'm not leaving you. I'm here with you. I want to help you walk through that. I want to help you walk through that. That's what a mentor does. He doesn't abandon. Jesus never abandoned us. He's walking with us. Mentoring is fighting the fight together. You're not alone. You're not alone. This understanding of sharing and suffering as a what good means have good character. Be faithful. Someone that just shows up. Someone that is willing to give up their agenda for the agenda of God's. Someone that's willing to be inconvenienced so somebody else can have a seat. Somebody that's willing to give everything that they are, whatever that might look like, for people to see Jesus more. I mean, that's what I mean, Paul is saying that sharing suffering is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4 says, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Our focus has to be on the Father's will, not our own. Our focus is on the Father's will, not our own. Because God has enlisted us in this. And the way we're not going to get caught up is by keeping our minds and our hearts and our souls on the one who enlisted us. Because there's a lot of times that I come to situations and I'm ready to kick the door down. I'm, I'm ready just to kick the door down and, and flip tables over and say, you guys should just go home. And my, my Paul, Pastor Stephen, has to say, whoa, let's, let's calm down a little bit, right? I agree with your message, but your method might be a little strong, right? And so let's pull it back a little bit. Let's pull it back. And a lot of times we look at that and say, oh, Pastor Stephen, my Paul doesn't love me. But the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Your Paul disciplines the one they love. So we understand it's our focus on the Father's will, not our own, that we have accountability. That's Paul is helping us learn. Timothy's are learning. Timothy's are becoming Paul's teaching other people. That it's just a process happening over and over and over again. Our focus is on the Father's will, not our own. Verse 5 says, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Followers of Jesus know the rules of God by reading God's word. How, how, listen, the only way that I'm able to preach and you're able to stay in the room is because you adhere to the same Bible that I adhere to and I'm teaching Scripture. And then you say, okay, this is actually what, what Paul is saying. This is what Paul is telling Timothy. And, and we're in the room and we're learning, we're understanding. We might not see everything eye to eye, but we understand the main purpose, the main focus. Understand the main principles of what God has set before us. So we're able to be crowned. We're able to compete because we're running the race according to what God has set. Verse 6 says, it is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first shares of the crops. I think what we need to learn from this and understand from this is as mentors, Paul's of the faith, work hard for our mentees, Timothy's of the faith, to see Jesus more. Mentors, Paul's of the faith, work hard, and I mean it's a, it's a work in progress, right? Work hard for our mentees, Timothy's of the faith, to see Jesus more. Because when, when this, is what, this is what really helps us to create a culture that we want to create as the church. As Paul's walking through life, what we should be doing, as Timothy's walking through life, when we mentor with a walk and a talk that is kingdom growth driven, then we will create a culture, Jesus followers, that will do the same. When we mentor with a walk and a talk that is kingdom growth driven, then we create a culture of Jesus followers that will do the same. As we go back to verse 1 and 2, we understand that we are strengthened by the grace in Jesus. Verse 2 says, hey, entrust to faithful men and women and teach them to do the same. So if we're walking and talking with kingdom might, my, kingdom growth in our minds and we're walking and living that out, then people that come under us that we're teaching, that we're growing with say, okay, I understand this. So now I got to go get other people and bring them in. I got to go get other people, bring them in. Other people, bring them in. Other people, bring them in. I believe with all my heart and soul and mind that Jesus Christ died for all of our sins and that we need to be carrying the message of the gospel to that ends of the earth. And I believe God's grace, I believe his salvation is able to cover all believers, all people that come to the saving grace of knowledge and the truth of Jesus. I believe that so much so that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get after it. And I think Belmont is a church that's willing to do whatever it takes to get after it. And so it's a blessing to be able to partner with people to understand like we've got to be able to do whatever to get after it. 
whatever it takes to get after it. Verse 7, it says, think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Paul is telling Timothy right now, hey, think what I've just said. Think, dwell on what I've just said. Understand what I've just said. And the way you understand that is for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. The Lord will give you understanding in everything. God gives us everything we need to know. So entrust his people with the gospel so we all see God's kingdom grow. My mission is not to make a bunch of makings. My mission as a Paul is to work hard for, our, for my Timothys to see Jesus more so they can fulfill their calling through God's grace. We come, at it, we come at it with an agenda of saying, I want to make everybody like me. We've missed it. We've missed it. We come and say, hey, we want to make a bunch of Jesus followers. That's what I want to do. That's what I believe Belmont Baptist Church wants to do. And it's going to take some work. It's going to take some faith. It's going to take some inconvenience moments, uncomfortable moments. It's just going to take a lot of things that we might not want. But I'm telling you, the glory that flows through this place is so crazy. It's so radical, we can't fathom it. I mean, seeing, seeing people get baptized. I mean, just seeing salvations happen. Seeing people take next steps. Seeing people get on stage that usually wouldn't. People that are sharing out of these walls saying, hey, I want to share Jesus with you even at the lunch table. I want to share Jesus with you even when we're working out, even when we're at the job, even when we're doing this, that, other, whatever the case might be is, that we can share the gospel. We can understand, hey, it's about mentoring so much so that we're willing to give everything that we are so somebody else can have a win. Somebody else can fulfill their calling. As, a, as, a, as we're closing invitation time, I, I, I think and my, my heart and my prayer for all of us in the room is, is some of you might be saying, hey, Macon, that sounds really cool, but I don't have a, I'm not a Paul and I'm not a Timothy because I don't know who Jesus is. That's a, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a good place to be at. We want to help you understand who Jesus is more. So come talk to me. Come talk to anybody on staff. Come talk to anybody in the back. Come talk to somebody. Ask somebody before you leave today, how do I, know, how do I understand Jesus more? And they'll find the right person to help you understand if they can't answer all your questions. Then if you have some really crazy questions, then Pastor Stephen will do all of them. It might be in that case. Maybe you're a Paul and say, hey, Macon, I, I, I have some people that I'm mentoring, but I'm just kind of slacked on it. And I, and I think I was asking this question to some people, some of my friends, nobody at Belmont. And it was funny. I said, hey, who's your Paul? And I fall victim to this too. Hey, who's your Paul? And, and that's really easy to say who's your Paul for, in my case. But sometimes in my moments, people are like, hey, who's your Timothy? And when I was younger, I would just throw out a name. I ain't talked to them in five years, but they're my Timothy. And I think it's important for us to understand, like, that's why it's an intimate relationship that Paul and Timothy had because they knew one another's name. They knew one each other's story. They knew what was happening. They loved one another. And I cannot do this alone. I cannot do this alone. That is, I'm a Paul teaching Timothys of understanding. I have to be intentional with them. I can't just say, hey, all these are my Timothys for my ego and say, well, I ain't talked to him in five years, though. I ain't talked to him in ten years, though. I, I, this is my Paul, but I haven't talked to Paul, my Paul, and I can't tell you how long. You and I have to be real with one another if we want to see the church flourish the next 60, 70, 80,000 million years. And I invite you to do that this morning. Some of you might be saying, hey, Megan, I, I, I'm a Paul, and I've learned a lot, I've learned a lot, I've learned a lot, and I want to help teach somebody else. Say, Megan, I just don't have a Timothy. And I say, hey, let me know that. I got a bunch of Timothys for you. I got a whole bunch of people that need to be discipled. I cannot do it alone. I think that's a blessing this morning to understand that God of the universe has invited us into his work through his son, Jesus. And I want to see Belmont grow. But more than Belmont growing, I want to see kingdom growth. Because if the kingdom's growing within this circle, Belmont's going to grow. I love Belmont Baptist Church. I love what Jesus is doing.